Uh, let's let's start at the top. What is a mono repo? You might have heard the term, but it's essentially a single repository, in this case, a Git repository that has multiple projects or multiple packages or multiple apps inside of it. You can check out Wikipedia. They talk about it. I'm going to read you their definition. Inversion control system. So a version control system is something like Git. These days, Git is kind of the default, but there's other ones out there like Subversion, Team Foundation Server, if that still exists. I <laughs> think these are just some things that I've used in the past in my career. But these days, is Git is kind of like the main one. Uh, in uh, version control systems, a mono repo is a software development strategy in which the code for a number of projects is stored in the same repository. The practice dates back to at least the early 2000s when it was commonly called a shared code base. Google, Meta, Microsoft, Uber, Airbnb, and Twitter all employ very large mono repos with varying strategies to scale build systems. Um, this is actually fascinating to learn about once you get into this. The entire Google code base, like everything, everything at Google is in a single repo. Any Anytime someone at Google, I, I guess, I mean, I, I don't know if this is still the case, but at least when I was learning about it, that was the case. And anytime someone wants to make a code change, it literally gets merged into the main repo that like basically manages and controls the all of the software of the entire company. So that's a thing. But this is not a monolithic application. I want to make that clear distinction because a lot of times when people hear mono repo, they think of monolith and a monolith is just one really big application, which is in contrast to a microservices architecture, I guess, sort of. There's probably other things too, but the idea of a monolith, like think of it as like one giant app that does everything. That's not what we're talking about here. And specifically, like that'll start to become clear once I show you what we're going to do with it. We're not creating a monolith. We have a mono repo to manage multiple small packages and multiple small apps. But that's that's a good a, a good distinction to make um, is that this is not a monolith. It's a mono repo. Is for example Rails, Django, and Laravel a monolith? It is possible to build a monolithic application with Rails or Django or Laravel or even Express, honestly. You would really only call it a monolith if you just have one code base that contains everything, like all of your services, all basic, everything that manages the application, if it's in a single running application, that's a monolith. It's possible to not do that, even with Rails or Django or Laravel. I'm sure you could actually have like little one-off microservices. So you have like multiple Rails apps or multiple Django apps or multiple Laravel apps that are all orchestrated to, to work together, but they're still separate. That's possible as well. Okay, so that's what a mono repo is. A single, we'll say repo, in our case, a Git repo, has multiple packages, apps, or libraries. Let's talk about why we would need one. Specifically, one of the main uses I'm going to have is uh, code sharing. Now, there's a lot of ways to share code, right? One way is to just publish something to NPM and then install it in some of your other projects that you might have. That's a completely valid way of, of, of sharing code. I mean, for, for basic purposes, that, that could probably work. And so if we look at the example right now of the thing that I want to put in my mono repo is this emote parsing library. This is some code in my backend API. It's called parse emotes and it handles all the work of creating like a regular expression that can parse emotes that are from better Twitch TV, Franker faces, and 7TV. This is fairly useful code and it's used in a lot of places. It's used in this overlay. It's used in the, the drop game and it's also used in my alert overlay because like if someone does a resub or gives bits but they have emotes in their message, I want to be able to display those emotes. So this code is used in like three different code bases. And right now I have a very bad practice of just copy pasting this code into the different places that I want to use it. And that's not good because if I fix a bug in one place, then I have to fix the bug in multiple places. So copy pasting is, is never good. So code sharing is one reason why we would have a mono repo. Essentially, we could have that emote parsing library as a package and then any other app that needs it can just link to it without having to install it all the way from NPM or like without having to, to copy paste. So code sharing and code reuse is one of the one of the main main things. Uh, another thing you'll see with mono repos is sharing types. So in the JavaScript and TypeScript world, if you have a mono repo that has both your front end and your back end, some code is potentially reusable. Uh, things like maybe your Zod validators, um, anything that like doesn't have any like secrets in it, that is essentially something that you might want to run on both the front end and the back end. 
you could create a, a package called types that has all of your validators and types that you want to share between your front end and your back end. This is one thing we're going to use as well. So all, all of our packages are going to be written using TypeScript, and we might have some types that describe responses that we get back from like the Twitch API or the YouTube API. And instead of having to copy paste those types everywhere, we can specify them in one spot and then import them into any of the packages that might that might need them. A monorepo is not the only way to share code or reuse code. You could use NPM to install a package that's published to GitHub or any other Git source. So that's one way to share code. But for larger apps, it doesn't scale as well. It, it starts to break down once you need to have specific versions. And once you need to install it in multiple places, it, 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 it's not as easy to just randomly publish something to NPM or randomly pull in a package for, that's posted on GitHub. You could also do Git submodules. Yeah, that's another option where you have like a single repo with Git submodules. Each of those is actually their own separate repo. Yeah, and Pablo, Pablo has a good succinct description. A monorepo allows you to have local package that multiple apps can use. Yeah, and you don't even have to publish it to NPM. Exactly. I mean, that, that's why this is like very useful, especially like for large code bases at companies and internally, like you sometimes you don't want to publish something to NPM to be reusable, but you want it to be reusable within your own code base. Um, and this will let you do that. I, however, am going to publish some of the packages that I have in that repo. Like emote parsing is something that a lot of people want to do. So that one specific package I will publish to NPM in that, but it will live inside my mono repo. There will be other things in my mono repo that I'm not going to publish to NPM because it's just for me and the tools that I use, but they can live in the same uh, mono repo. Uh, are there disadvantages of a mono repo? It, it's, it's more setup. There's more configuration. Sometimes your the things that you're doing don't necessarily like if they're in a nested folder versus being at the root. So you could run into issues there. There there are fixes when you come across stuff like that, but the Wikipedia page lists disadvantages. Cool. Uh, loss of version information. In our case, this won't be the case. Like each of our packages and, and apps can each have their own version. I think it makes it makes it easier if they're all running on the same version, depending on your project, but it is possible to have them each as a separate version. Yeah, lack of per project access control. Like if someone gets access to this repo, they get access to everything in the repo. I'm not worried about that because everything I'm doing here is open source anyways. But if you're working at a company, maybe you have one code base that you only want to give access to certain people. If it's in the mono repo, you basically give them access to everything. And yeah, it's going to be a lot more storage and more to clone because it's you have to clone the whole thing down. So that, that's that's stuff to think about for sure. It is higher complexity. We're we're <laughs> we're we're going to spend a non-zero amount of time in configuration files, making sure everything works nicely together. But yeah, yeah, and again, it's not a silver bullet, but it is. It's going to work for what we need for sure. If you go to a Git repo, and it has a folder called packages, it is very likely that that Git repo is a mono repo. And so Vue.js is a mono repo. If we look in their packages folder, they have three different packages that make up the the Vue ecosystem. They have the single file component compiler, the server render, and the template compiler. Those are all nested packages that are all published separately to npm but can be used by by other projects. If you look at React, this is this is the actual source code for React. And if we look, it has a packages folder, and then inside of there, this has a bunch of separate packages. Um, so you have the actual React package, you have React DOM, React Refresh, all, all of these various parts and pieces of React have been broken up into separate packages for one, so that other projects could potentially use them. But also internally, you might say that like React DOM is dependent on React, but also React DevTools is dependent on React. And they, they can now be in separate folders, but still like depend on each other. Yeah, and if you look at the AngularJS code base, it too is a mono repo. It has a packages folder and then inside of there, uh, we've got the CLI, the compiler, core. Each one of these folders is a separate package that all, all makes up Angular. So it's in a lot of places, it's, and it's being and used, used in a lot of places. Yeah, why do you need something like NX? We'll, we'll get into that. We're going to get into that because it's possible to not use any one of these tools. You could literally just have a single Git repo that has a bunch of projects in it. But one of the things that we want to be able to do is import code from one package into another one. Because we're in uh, JavaScript and TypeScript, if I wanted to import something that's that lives in like a directory above me, I could just use a, rel a relative file path, like dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash. A better way to do that is if these packages know about each other's names, then they can literally be listed as dependencies for each other. So you're not like referencing via file path, you're referencing by name. Yeah, we don't want to do this. <laughs> this is what we're going to avoid doing. We have multiple packages. JSON. So every project will have their own list of dependencies, but it is possible to share dependencies. Like 
if every single project is going to be using like the TypeScript package, for example, I do believe we can share that dependency from the root. You don't necessarily need an extra tool. You could just, if you're already using NPM or Yarn or PNPM, they have a built-in way to do workspaces. I'll show you what we're using NX for. All right, there's a lot of options for mono repos, but built in, it, it, it wasn't always this way. When I was working at a consultancy professionally, I actually used this tool called Lerna because at the time, NPM and I don't think Yarn supported any kind of like mono repo thing. So I was using Lerna for a large code base that had like three Node.js packages, two backend APIs. I had a shared library where I, I shared all of my database models because that's that's another useful thing you might have if you have a, a bunch of apps. Like let's say you have two different backend apps that potentially need to talk to the same database. You can create a package that has all of your database models in it and then it can be shared by those two backends. But yeah, I use Lerna, but these days, it's just built into the package manager that you might might use. So if you look up NPM workspaces, you can look in the NPM docs. They literally talk about this thing called workspaces. It just comes built in with NPM and it allows you to have folders with nested projects inside of them. And one of the main reasons you, you would want this feature is if a nested project needs to reference something else, it just references it by name. But when you run NPM install, if it's set up for workspaces, it's smart enough to know that, oh, well, this package doesn't actually come from NPM. This package just comes from the folder in the packages folder. And it figures all of that out whenever you do an NPM install, as long as you've, you've set it up in the right way. And so we're actually going to be using this. NX is going to set this up for us by default, but there are extra tools we're going to use from NX. And then both Yarn and NPM all can do a similar thing. And then Turbo Repo is from the people that created Next.js for sell. And so this, this is also potentially an option. And then one thing that I found in my research was that I hadn't heard about before was this thing called the Rush Stack. And this is actually from Microsoft. And they have a really good breakdown on their website of like why you would even need something like this. And they actually do talk about, well, yeah, it increases complexity. And but at larger companies and in larger code bases, uh, this is something that you would need. And, and you, you basically you uh, take that trade off more complexity for better code sharing, code reuse, and potentially setting up a repo to match match your like team and business processes. Like maybe you have a mono repo with various packages and each team is like working on a different package or a different app that's in that mono repo, that kind of thing. Oh yeah, and then Basil, yeah. Um, this one seems like it was more so for native code, right? It says, Basil is a fast, correct, and scalable tool for building and testing Java, C++, Go, Android, iOS, and many other languages. Oh, maybe they support TypeScript or JavaScript too. But yeah, this is another one too. There's a lot of options. You could get lost in the options. We're gonna use NX using their command line tool. I have to give it a name. Yeah, let's let's spend two, let's spend, let's spend two hours just trying to figure out what we're gonna call it greenhouse is pretty good greenhouse is really good okay but i'm gonna i'm gonna run this command create an nx workspace and i'm going to call it greenhouse and now it's going to ask us what we want so what stack do we want to use this is one of the cool things about nx is it has project scaffolding one of the one of the things i, I spend so much time doing is just like creating base projects but like i mean sometimes i want to create a view app or a spell app where i want to create a node library or an express backend or something like that and they have these these project scaffolders built in so i'm going to start with none so this is going to be create a base mono repo and then once i have the base mono repo i can start to add packages to it of various types so i'm going to go none and then they have a, a few options so package based is what we want where each package can kind of like stand alone it can be published separately there's something about integrated um where it like shares honestly like we we might want integrated but it's from my reading you can run into some issues with tools when you're trying to share dependencies so it's kind of just easier if you just go with package based anyways so we're gonna go with package based and then this question is basically asking you if you want to use uh, in X cloud, which I'm not going to worry about right now. We can always set that up later, but essentially that gives you like a CI server that can do automatic publishing to NPM and, and various and automatic builds and stuff like that. So I'm going to say no to that for now. And this will give us just a blank folder with a package.json set up, and then we can start adding pack packages to it. We now have greenhouse, but this is it. And as you can see, there's no code right now. It's all just configuration. And if you look in our package.json, NX has configured this for us to use NPM workspaces. So it's already saying, hey, all of my packages are going to exist in a folder called packages. And right now we only have two dependencies. We have the NX tool, um, which is like a CLI tool that's going to have all of these generators and commands that we can use. And then let's see what else we got. So we have the NX.json. I'm not familiar with what this is yet. It looks like... It has like some settings that NX uses. I think one of the other aspects of using a tool like NX 
is uh, it does caching. So it does like build caching and then NPM install caching. So like if you have two separate packages that have similar dependencies, NX is going to make things faster when you're running installs and stuff like that. Seems fine. All right. So we've got our, we've got our base, our base mono repo. Let's add a package to it. The first thing we want is just a node library. We're going to create a package that uh, does emote parsing, which we talked about earlier. Um, but this will just be a Node.js and, and TypeScript package. It, it's not an Express app. It's not a front-end app. It's literally just JavaScript code that parses emotes. And that will just be a Node.js library. So for that, we can go do the thing. Like, I forget where I found it. But there's something about just adding a library. Yeah, there's like these generators. And specifically, they have a Node generator. Node library. So there, there, like I said, there's a bunch of generators. I specifically want to use this one because I want a Node.js library. I'm going to copy this and uh, I'm going to call it emote parser. So I'm creating a library called emote parser. And then the directory it should be in is packages slash emote parser. Here we go. Ah, uh, you can install NX globally, but I'm just going to do NPX. So it'll use NX that's installed uh, in my node modules in this folder. Here we go. We will use vtest to test the emote parser. And then we can specify a build tool. I'm just going to use uh, TypeScript. So I'll specify TypeScript. And it's going to do all the stuff. Here's the thing. It's going to set up a default ESLint config, a default prettier config. It's going to set up a, a TS config in the root that then gets shared by that project. And then any other project I add will also extend from that base TS config. You'll, you'll see all the cool stuff it does. Um, but I'm going to start here. I want a package called emote parser. And it's going to be in the folder called packages emote parser. But check this out. It created a bunch of configs. Now, you could you could be like, oh no, here we go. All these, all these configs. <laughs> all these configs in my folder. But uh, what's nice is it like it managed it like I didn't have to do anything. I ran the command, it gave us some nice sensible defaults. Um, and then you can also see that it um, it created this packages folder, and then inside of that we have our emote parser package. But this too has a bunch of configs. Now, this kind of is the state of things. Like each of these configs has a use, and ideally we don't have to touch it. I think I think that's the best case. Is like the config is just set up and ready to go. We can spend our time writing code and working on features and not worrying about the configs. But if we need to, they're still there. We have like the ESLint ignore, which ignores node modules. We have our base ESLint RC. Dot JSON. So this is all of our linting rules preset up for us. We have our pretty RC ready to go. And then we also have a TS config. So we're going to be using TypeScript in all of our packages and, and apps. And this is a base config that will be used by each one. So we have the base config here that defines all the, the common things we want for every app. And then if we look at a specific package like emote parser, we can see that its TS config extends the base one. So any any uh, settings we want across all of our packages and apps, we do that in the root, and then anything custom for this app, we'll, we'll do it in, in this file. Uh, same thing goes for the ESLint config. So you can see that it extends the one in the root, but then we can add custom rules and settings in here that apply to just this, just this package. So uh, in, in my research, this is one of the main reasons why I picked NX, is it, it just does all of this for us, and it kind of just sets it up ready to go. So typically when you're creating a library to be used, like, internally but also like when you publish to npm you almost always want an entry point that exports all of the things that you create in this case it just gives us a, a base function called emote parser that gets exported uh, but we can update this with the actual code that we need and it bootstrapped it with a uh, vtest so we already have tests ready to go for 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 the app but yeah look we're, we're ready to go we can just start coding i don't have to worry about any configs i can literally just start coding and uh, that's what i'm here for